Looking at the poll I put out on Saturday, it's pretty clear to see that the Halo 40k crossover videos are what my audience is most interested in, and how else can I form parasocial relationships without giving the fans what they want? So the forerunners at their height 10 million years ago when they set out to destroy the precursors are going to be shoved into the 40k universe, and I actually want to present this situation as I did in my second Flood Tyranids video, with different scenarios and sub-scenarios. I hope you guys enjoy. Before we can even begin to compare the Forerunners to anything in 40k, it's important to look at what little sources we have on the heights of the Forerunners. To shine a light on this obscure part of Forerunners lore, I'm going to be talking largely about the Forerunner trilogy. They are written by the late and great Greg Bear, specifically the final book in the trilogy, Silentium. Because in Silentium, the librarian leaves the Milky Way galaxy and embarks on a journey to discover the truth. So, the librarian goes to Path Cathona, or the Large Magellanic Cloud, whatever you want to call it. I'm going to say Large Magellanic Cloud so that way I can pad for view time. When she gets to the satellite galaxy, the first thing she she notice is star roads webbing across every single planet and star system just like the precursors of old. And along these star roads, around a single small planet registered as Sodaro, rested a truly massive Forerunner fleet. This fleet was from 10 million years ago, and after collecting logs from these still barely functional ships, it's revealed that the Forerunners who had set out to genocide their fathers had actually felt so bad for killing their dads that they were either killed or genetically modified to live an extremely primitive life. Yeah, there was a third option of committing, you know, not alive, but that's not safe for YouTube. And when I say modified to live an extremely primitive life, I'm not just talking about reducing them down to a caveman level of tech. The grass, trees, the moss, and the livestock, all of it was Forerunners. And using this knowledge, we can get a rough gauge for their tech level. They had mastered genetic modification to a point where they had converted the vast majority of the survivors of this armada into a biosphere. Let that sink in for a second. Not only were they able to shape and create life, but able to attach a consciousness or some limited autonomy to any existing life form. It takes some serious genetic modification tools to turn a super advanced and complicated species into moss, and even more to turn a humanoid species into every aspect of the biosphere. The planet was barren before the Forerunners arrived. There's a lot of really fun encounters between these primitive Forerunners and the Librarian, but I'm not going to touch on story bits. These books are so good and I can't recommend you reading them yourselves enough. But moving back into the space surrounding Sidaro, we also also get a brief monologue of the librarian from when she starts to prod the ancient ships, and most importantly amongst all these massive ships was a large sphere. But before I reveal what that sphere is, some fun lore. The librarian was able to actually put together that the ancient forerunners who came here had not been restricted to the same slip space limitations that the forerunners of right before the fall had to endure. Towards the end of the forerunner ecumene, we know that the domain, along with slip space, had a limit or a quote unquote budget. In the books, it's described that slipspace travel within recent Forerunner history was extremely regulated, and that there was trouble reaching the domain despite the Forerunners having their entire history been able to access this. It's heavily implied that the Domain is somewhere in slip space, but we later find out that the Domain is in the Milky Way, and that it only used slip space to transmit and receive data. The Librarian is then able to conclude that the Sphere was an ancient Forerunner method of anchoring, or allowing for more than the intended amount of mass to pass through. She's also able to guess that the Forerunners of old had put a veil over their hyper-advanced tech as a way to hide their shame. Or, for those that escaped, they used it to suppress that information and walk away knowing that they essentially had the keys to the galaxy. Using that information, we know that the Forerunners of 10 million years ago had technology that was either equal to or greater than the Halo Arrays, since the ancient Forerunners were able to kill the Precursors way before the Halo Arrays were constructed by Born Stellar Makes Eternal Lasting's dad. Which, I have to add that with the Forerunner trilogy of books, we know that the Isodidact, who was just a Forerunner child with the above mentioned named, that the Didact roughly cloned or printed onto himself. We also know that from Halo 4 that the Master Chief has the imprint of the Isodidact. So, if you choose to stretch it, Master Chief's dad is responsible for firing the Halo Arrays. 
Moving on, like that's not going to cause an argument or two, these ancient forerunners essentially had decided to set a max tech level for their children or offspring. This veil was so thorough, it took around 10 million years to barely breach. And I mean, this was a little pinprick of insight into their ancient zenith. The forerunners at the time of the fall had believed themselves to be at their zenith, but we know for certain that they were at the mercy of slipspace and the domain, unlike their ancient counterparts. So with the background out of the way, we're going to segue into the scenarios. For how the Forerunners breach into the 40k universe, let's just say that the Precursors blow up the Slipspace Anchor that I mentioned previously, and that the Forerunner Armada is sent out of Slipspace and somehow ends up in the 40k universe. It's not very elaborate, but it's far more sane than how I plan on having the Forerunners of the Fall get to the 40k universe. Scenario 1 is the scenario with by far the least substance, as the Forerunner fleet just somehow ends up near the Eye of Terror or somewhere in Slipspace. Either they try to jump back into Slipspace using what tech they have, or just landing poorly. The Forerunners themselves, being on a genocidal campaign of Vengeance and Hubris, would fall immediately to the Chaos Gods. Corn and Zinch are easy since they desire strength and deception. I also can't imagine that the Forerunners who had reached such a technological zenith wouldn't have a little bit of depravity in them similar to the Drukhari. I like to think that each of the ancient Forerunners had the equivalent of a big titty goth AI girlfriend in their heads telling them to just kill the Flood. And that fits Slanesh. Nurgle is the only one I don't see a lot of people turning to. Granted, the Forerunners did have life workers. The entire reason that they even ended up in this scenario is since they were fighting a godlike space plague voiced by a well voiced older man. And before we move on to scenario two, can you imagine just how strong Forerunner AI must have been? They put a hard limit on tech, which I can only assume includes AI. The thought of Chaos having Mentican bias is terrifying, but add a few steps of tech mastery and a whole lot of daddy issues into the equation, and the cybernetic revolt looks like a good time to be alive. And keep in mind, every single Forerunner had AI and each ship had its own onboard AI, some of which never even had to choose a physical form because they just never interacted with the Forerunner or any actual organic species. Giving Zinch a super AI is just a bad time, and Slanesh getting access to AI sex bots is the scariest and most intriguing thing in this scenario. Scenario 2 is the Forerunner show up before the Eye of Terror broke out across the galaxy. Let's, for the benefit of the doubt here, throw the Forerunners into Imperial space. No matter what, the Imperium loses. We're also not going to allow slip space navigation since this is a different universe with a lot of different laws. Let's assume that this Forerunner fleet is sent out as vanguards to try and break through slip space. This is such a bad idea. Every single Forerunner in that vanguard force would be at the whims of Chaos, and believe me, Chaos would be looking. In 40k, humans are said to be the strongest influence on the war, and in Halo, we know that the Forerunners and the human come from the same ancestor species, the Inheritors. So, it's not much of a logical stretch to assume that these Forerunners would have a similar warp affinity. I am, however, going to make their warp affinity a little bit weaker in this scenario, since we know that the Precursors chose humanity over the Forerunners. And for simplicity's sake, let's just say the Precursors chose humanity because of this, in some multiversal clusterfucky way. I just really have no way of answering that question, and the Precursors and Chaos are largely the same thing. Back on track, the gods of the warp, along with any independent or particularly ambitious demons, instantly start paying attention to the extremely advanced flotilla that just broke into hell. As with before, these would most certainly be corrupted, and in a worst case scenario, Ashtor manages to corrupt a Forerunner to his side and he would gain access to the zenith of the Forerunner technology, which is a instant game over. Demons having tech at or above the level of the Necrons would mean that GW would have a nightmare figuring out how to write in that demons have always and never had Forerunner tech. Thankfully though, in this scenario, the Forerunners use their heads for once and only send a vanguard force. When and where this vanguard force would burst through the warp 
it would take the combined effort of most of the galaxy to handle, unless it shows up right in front of the rest of the Forerunner Armada. Let's for gits and shiggles say that they pop back into real space in the exact same spot and almost the exact same time as they left. The remaining Forerunner flotilla would suffer horrible losses, despite ultimately winning. This greatly diminished Forerunner fleet would still be quite the formidable foe to any faction in the galaxy. If they managed to find a relatively quiet corner of the galaxy to colonize, it wouldn't take long for them to get back to a really solid tech and industry level. Given that among this armada was the tools to genetically modify an entire planet into a biosphere, it isn't out of the question for them to set up a colony and develop some advanced industry over a decade. Also, considering that the Forerunners really like to use light to craft stuff, there are plenty of star systems and even sectors of the galaxy where the Forerunners could thrive unhindered for far more than enough time. Now, it is an assumption that the ancient Forerunners would be using hard light in the same way that the modern Forerunners do, but we've made about a thousand assumptions so far, so let's just put this in the pile. In this scenario, the Forerunners find the exact same humans that were chosen by the Precursors, and the Forerunners being in this situation because of the perceived transgression of this same species would bring a wrath on a level unforeseen to the Imperium. Forerunner AIs would be able to completely control any and all systems used by most sapient species throughout the galaxy, and I can see the Forerunners, while losing a war of attrition or just a running conflict with the Necrons, having their AI infiltrate and corrupt the Necrons programming. It's also a good time to mention that the Forerunners are in a small group of sci-fi factions that actually fights wars in a kind of smart way. They use drones, which they call sentinels, and they could send out millions and millions of sentinels to every corner of the galaxy, and this is just a drop in the bucket for them. On the other hand, 40k, every single faction, or just about every single faction, uses some degree of human wave tactics to just completely drown the enemy in meat. This would not work against the Forerunners, as they could just throw an uncountable swarm of Sentinels to deal with almost any factions. The Tyranids would actually be a really tough fight for the Forerunners, funnily enough. At this point, the Forerunners would not be able to deal with the sheer quantity of mass being thrown at them, and I can see the hive mind directing a large portion of its gaze into the Ecumene Secundus so that way it can absorb the level of tech mastery brought into this galaxy. Unfortunately though, the Forerunners wouldn't be able to offer a lot of biomass, only knowledge and whatever scrap and minerals can be collected from the glitterings of shrapnel left behind. Scenario 3 is a short one with the Forerunner fleet showing up in Imperial space and this time being nearly immediately noticed and hailed. Considering that this would be an immediate encounter between the Forerunners and the Imperium, as opposed to a situation where there's some buffer time to adjust to their new reality, the Forerunners would begin a genocidal campaign against the Imperium, and absolutely nothing is going to stop this. A venerable wave of Sentinels would be unleashed upon every single Imperial world, mining station, and far-flung outpost. Within a century, I can see the entire galaxy being purged of human life. But once again, the Forerunners fall victim to their own hubris. As the Forerunners have acted too quickly in anger, they have fueled chaos with the agonizing wails of an entire species or an entire galaxy. Chaos would be so empowered by the sheer quantity of bloodshed and literal chaos cascading across the Milky Way, Corn, without a doubt, would then become the most powerful chaos god again, and with the Forerunners having a similar war presence to humanity, this would empower chaos even more, meaning that the Forerunners Forerunners would be fighting an enemy at their tech level that just doesn't die. Forerunners with no knowledge outside of acquired knowledge from humanity about the warp and banishment would be completely outmatched. Decisive chaos victory, galaxy burns. I'm not bringing up the Emperor or any situation like that. The, 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 for, forerunners. So for scenario 4, I decided to just go all out for this one, and if you've made it this far, A, thank you, and B, buckle up, because we're going from a 3 to a 10 on the crazy scale. In this final scenario, the Forerunner Armada shows up in Path Cathona around M40 and they are confused as to how quiet everything is. This isn't the same galaxy they had chased their dads into. They quickly put together that 10 million years worth of stellar drift and collisions have occurred, and that the galaxy, held the universe as they know it, is gone. This entire section of this galaxy, or even the entire universe as they know it, is completely barren. Unlike the galaxy the Forerunners came from, which was teeming with life, here they found none. 
They set up shop in the satellite galaxy, and with their extremely advanced tech, it doesn't take long for their industry to get started. The Armada is broken up into hundreds of vanguard fleets sent out in every direction. Almost all of these fleets return claiming everything in the galaxy to be barren, but strangely, a few fleets send out perplexing reports of life. The first of these ships is sent to investigate, and soon enough it's set upon by living warships. Hard light beams are set loose from the Forerunner vessels, instantly killing anything caught in their path. But it was not enough, and soon they receive the full attention of their adversary, with tendrils and teeth scraping against the shields of the Forerunner ships. Despite being confident in their shielding, satisfied with the sound of flesh cauterizing against energy shields, the Forerunner scout fleet is quickly engulfed, completely subsumed by an unending tide of bugs. The Tyranids. The Forerunner Armada quickly consolidates as all scouting flotillas are recalled for immediate defense. As soon as the Forerunner Armada had reconstituted, they began a thrust forward towards the approaching tendrils. Now, with the combined effort of the main armada, the Forerunners begin to throw waves of sentinels into the maw of the ever-closing Tyranid menace. Waves of metal and hard light crash into the Tyranid bioforms, shattering and dissolving with every hit. And after a brief period, the fighting stops as at this point the Forerunners had not lost a single man. Yes, they had lost trillions of Sentinels, but those are just Sentinels, and a few trillions spent on a war effort is trivial to even the decadent Forerunners right before their fall. We can imagine that an empire able to traverse the void between galaxies would be able to foot the bill for quintillions of Sentinels. But keep in mind they are separated from almost all of their industry needed to produce them. Granted, it wouldn't take long to get the infrastructure necessary to build them, they wouldn't have the time to print enough of them. But the Tyranids do not know this, and so the hive mind, after realizing there was no winning this battle, fled, leaving what little biomass and resources left within this satellite galaxy in an attempt to save themselves. In a panic, the hive mind set up sensory organs in every direction, hoping to find a nearby galaxy to consume. But this is when a strange twist of fate occurs. So close to home, there was light. Only for a moment, but light nonetheless. And so, these sensory organs were consumed, and its biomass recycled as the journey to the Milky Way begins. Not only does the 40k galaxy have to deal with the Nids, but they're now running from the Forerunners.